Welcome back. It is the Vegas Take. Sharp and Shapiro, so glad you could join us. By the way, uh, coming up at the bottom of the hour, former Raider quarterback Jay Schrader will be joining us. They got a huge charity golf tournament uh, coming up around the NFL draft, so uh, Jay will be joining us coming up here at the bottom of the hour. You know, uh, I grew up idolizing UNLV basketball. I wasn't in Vegas yet, but, of course, in the early 90s with the championship team and, and everything that was surrounding around Jerry Tarkanian, Man, that was a fun time. Fun time for college basketball. I wish I was here to see it myself. But I've had plenty of conversations with uh, Jerry Tarkanian over the years, the late great. And uh, he's always so gracious with his time. Uh, I interviewed him a bunch of times, and uh, I just love talking to the guy. What a great man and what a great basketball mind. And he did so many wonderful things for the community. And uh, his son has joined us plenty of times on this show, uh, many of which have been in studio. Danny Tarkanian has a new book out called Rebel with a Cause. He's going to be signing that book at the UNLV Colorado State game tonight. And he joins us right now on the line. Danny, thank you so much for being here. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me on. Yeah, I always appreciate hey, what's you, Danny. Up, Danny? Uh, I want before we before we get to this book, and I'm really excited to talk to you about it. I just want we, we've been covering this Mike Lavinati stuff, as you know. He was convicted on Friday, all three counts in this Nike extortion case. You've been in studio with Mike Lavinati. You've met him. Uh, what what are your thoughts on on the verdict, and what was your reaction to it? Well, I was very disappointed to see that happen. Uh, first of all, Michael is a very nice man. I got along very well with him. Uh, I I don't. Uh, I don't believe that um, the, the, the verdict was accurate, but I wasn't there, so I guess you got to go along with what they said. But I was very disappointed for it. I will say this. There's no doubt in my mind, and I know it, and everybody in college basketball knows it, that the shoe companies, and Nike included, they've all been involved with uh, supporting financially these uh, street runners, AAU uh, coaches and so forth, who are using the money that they get from Nike and or apparel to uh, – funnel it to players, and, and they're directing those players to colleges. It happens all the time. We've discussed it before in the show. That's what Michael said he was going to expose, and uh, that's what caused uh, – well, that, that was the starting point of, uh, of this lawsuit. We're, that yeah, we're no, no doubt. Well said, Danny. And, and if there's anything uh, positive to take away from this, obviously it's a horrible situation for Michael. It is hopefully, hopefully, Danny, exposing Nike and exposing the corruption in college basketball. I would, I would assume you would agree with that. Well, I would, I would, I would like to have seen it happen, but I think this is a way for Nike to get away unscathed uh, by taking the issue away from what they did that was wrong and and uh, in violation of NCAA rules and and certainly possibly even criminal st- uh, statutes from what we're seeing with the uh, investigations from the Adidas um, payouts. Right. Uh, but but it's all going to go away now that this uh, um, trial's over, and it's, that's unfortunate. Yeah, sadly, sadly, you're probably right on that one. Uh, Danny, I want to talk about this book, uh, Rebel with a Cause. First of all, when did it first enter your mind that you wanted to write this book? Tell me a little bit about it, and uh, give me a preview of it if you can. Sure. I started writing the book many years ago after my father retired, and I kept um, put in it. First of all, I wrote it, and I wrote it more like a lawyer, and um, put in a lot of things that were personal to me that wasn't probably interesting to the general public. So over the years, I rewrote it many, many times. I would say probably a hundred times or more. And I cut the book down from 170,000 words to 104,000, I believe. And I made it uh, kept in it just the parts that I think are really going to be of interest to the readers and where they're going to really enjoy. I took out almost everything that would have sounded uh, bitter or spiteful. I wanted it to be more factual-based. I was fortunate enough, my mother um, kept scrapbooks of of my father's career throughout his entire coaching span. So I was able to go through scrapbooks of when he first started at San Joaquin Memorial through the junior colleges and the Division I colleges that he coached and uh, had some really great uh, tidbits to put in the book. And then I also had access to all the NC2A investigation documents that they uh, provided in my dad's trial. I went through all those. So it was a long, 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 long time of research and stuff to put together. Right. I think the end product's going to be very, very interesting for the readers, particularly uh-huh. ones from Las Vegas that grew up during this time period. Yeah, I'm looking forward to reading it. And by the way, Danny Turkanian will be at the UNLV basketball game tonight against Colorado State signing his book. I want to talk to you a little bit about, you know, coaching today as compared to back then when your father was coaching. And, you know, we have a mutual friend, Danny, and that is Larry Eustacey, former college basketball coach. And he said something very interesting to me the other day. He said, you know, your father, Jerry, for the most part, had no backing from the university. He was fighting against, at times, his athletic director and, of course, the president 
at the time still you know trying to win a national championship and when you look at some of these coaches today and, and listen I'm not trying to badmouth some of the coaches today but listen the Mike Shashevskys of the world the John Calipari's of the world I'm sure these guys are good guys but the important thing is that they have the 100% backing of the university the athletic director the president Whereas your father, for the most part, didn't have that at all, and yet he was still able to win a national championship. That's what I found so amazing and fascinating about your dad. What do you think your father could have accomplished at UNLV? What more do you think he could have accomplished, if anything? I mean, he accomplished so much. If he had the backing of the right people. Uh, They were on the verge of having the second greatest dynasty in the history of college sports uh, outside of UCLA, which would be almost impossible to duplicate with the the, uh, balance in college sports now. They were on the verge. uh, When they fired my dad. Now, remember, he was 59, just turning 60. Right. I mean, I thought that was old at the time, but that's very young when you look at it now. There's coaches that are coaching into their 80s and mid-80s. And at the time, they had one, went to three uh, Final Fours in, in five years, one, one national championship. I had another team considered one of the greatest of all time that was undefeated until they lost to Duke. But they were going to get better players than what they had on that team. And people say, oh, that's crazy. What are you talking about? But they had Ed O'Bannon, Charles O'Bannon, and Sean Tarver signed to come to UNLV. Wow. And those three took UCLA to the national championship in 1995. They would have definitely took UNLV. We had uh, Jason Kidd committed as a sophomore. Loved UNLV. He was coming here, and he took Cal to their greatest records ever. We had a chance to get Jalen Rose uh, because he went to Anderson Hunt's high school, loved Anderson, loved the running Rebels. Mark Working Team, who was the assistant at UNLV at the time, said it the best. He said, we may not have had an end with the suburban kids, but the urban kids were all rebels. They all wanted to be a rebel. And mm-hmm. the best players are coming from the urban parts of our country, and they all wanted to be a rebel at the time. They, they would have had an incredible dynasty. Yeah, no no question about it. Now, I know in your book – yeah, go ahead. About, sure. You know, first of all, UNLV and their administration, they were great for, to my father and support him for – 15, 16 years. It was just a, the last group that came in, mm-hmm. uh, President Maxim, and when he put in Dennis Stenfrock as the athletic director, that they, they, they stopped supporting him. But the biggest thing, impediment to what my father could have accomplished, was his fights with the NC2A. And he took a Long Beach State program that had been Division Two before he got there, and in his third year, they lose to UCLA by two in the NC Toy tournament, which was the closest loss UCLA had in the entire seven year run of Dynasty. Mm-hmm. Well, the NC Toy came in, put Long Beach on probation. He goes to UNLV, gets to a Final Four in his fourth year at UNLV, and the NC Toy comes in and puts him on probation. Mm-hmm. But he had to run those two great teams you mentioned in the early 90s. They, again, they put so much pressure on UNLV that the, 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 the president folded and yeah. got rid of my dad and stopped the dynasty from being uh, yeah. taken place. It's just deplorable the way they treated your father the last few years he was at UNLV. Uh, Danny, I wanted to ask you a little bit what it was like playing for your father. Uh, how Did you feel like he treated you maybe more harsh or, or he was tougher on you because you were his son? Uh, how did he treat you compared to all the other players? What was that uh, father, son, player, coach relationship like back then? Yeah, you know, that's a really great question. My uh, my father, he didn't really go out of his way to be harder on me, but he made sure that he wasn't going to show any favoritism towards me. But I understood coming in. My dad did not want me to play for him. He made that clear when I was growing up, and it wasn't so much for my lack of ability. Um, it was that he'd watched a bunch of other great co- uh, coaches' sons play for them, Al McGuire's son did, and um, Bobby, um, the USC coach. Uh, um, anyways, their kids played for them. They were great players, and they mm-hmm. never played well for them. So he didn't want me to. So I had to still going in. I had to work harder than anybody else. I had to play harder than anybody else. I had to do more than anybody else. And I also had to pass more than anybody else. <laughs> Like, teammates like when you pass the ball and don't shoot. And I right. pass all the time, but I rarely shot. But back in the day, you know, when you're watching, uh, you know, your father coach this national championship team, and you see Greg Anthony, Larry Johnson, you you see all these guys out there. I mean, at that time, did you think that the entire starting lineup would be, you know, NBA players? What was, what were your thoughts on some of those teams that your father coached? And did you see Larry Johnson as possibly being an NBA Hall of Famer? Did you see Greg Anthony? How did you see those guys back then? And what did you yeah. think their future looked like? Well, everybody knew Larry Johnson was going to be a Hall of Famer or had the potential at least. He was a high school player of the year, the junior college player of the year, and the Naismith four-year college player of the year. And he was a rookie player of the year. Uh, Stacy Ogman really came out of nowhere. He was a great athlete and a great defender, but he wasn't much of a scorer, and he wasn't even 
all state. I don't even know if he's all city. Mm-hmm. Uh, might have been all city, but he wasn't a highly re- that highly recruited of a player, and he turned out to be just phenomenal. And Greg Anthony, you know, he went to the University of Portland out of high school. Right, wasn't terribly highly recruited, but he worked so hard. He was such a great kid um, that he became a lottery pick. Those three made the pros. The other ones didn't. Uh, the other ones were very good, like Anderson Hunt yeah. was arguably one of the top two shooting guards my dad coached, but he didn't make it. Can I ask I you about that, Danny? Because yeah. uh, Anderson's, I know he's a friend of yours. He's also a personal friend of mine, but uh, I think he would be the first one to admit, and you could tell me if you disagree or not, but Anderson made some bad choices off the basketball court. We're all not perfect. We all make mistakes. I personally believe that if Anderson just focused on basketball and took care of his body, uh, I think he he could have been not only an NBA player for a long period of time, but a really good NBA player. Would you agree with that? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And if the problem with for Anderson basketball wise, I know what you're mentioning off the court was Anderson played shooting guard with Greg Anthony. So he didn't get a chance to uh, handle the ball much. Mm-hmm. And when the uh, Greg graduated, Anderson had another year to come back to school and he was going to play the point for us, but he made the unwise decision of going pro as a junior and he never played point and he was only six foot tall. Uh, but he, boy, he jumped over anybody. He was faster than anybody. He could shoot the ball with anybody. He just wasn't a great ball handler or a passer, and he needed a year to work on that. And that was a bad decision. Right, right. No, fair enough. If you're joining us, we're speaking with Danny Tarkanian. His new book coming out, Rebel with a Cause. He's going to be at the Thomas and Mack Center tonight. Danny, can you just give people a little bit of information? Uh, are you going to be on the concourse? What time are you going to be there signing your book? Yeah, we're going to be on the concourse at, starting at 630. We'll stay throughout the game. Uh, so we'll be there uh, when the game's going on at halftime. And, gotcha. Um, and right. we'll be in the conference. I wanted to mention a couple of things that I think makes this book unique compared to anybody sure. else, sure. Uh, even on other coaches. My father had a unique ability to motivate players using sarcasm and wit, which back at that time, it was almost unheard of. Can you give me an he example? Had... Can you give me an example yeah. of something that he said that you could share with us? Yeah. Absolutely. Like, for example, when we did not play hard in practice, he'd call the team together in the huddle and he'd say, you guys are all a bunch of bandits. Next time you pick up the scholarship check, wear a mask and gun because you're robbing the university when you don't play hard. Rob them. <laughs> oh, that's great. I never heard that one before. So in the middle of a practice, you're telling me if he wasn't happy with what was going on, he said, you guys are robbing the university of a scholarship. That's funny. That's you're, hilarious. You're a bunch of bandits. And you know the thing about it is we're sitting there and, and he's yelling and he's serious, so you know you don't want to do anything to, to take that away. But at the same time, it's so damn funny you want to bust up and laugh. <laughs> and, and he and he had some great one-liners, like when he was we were coaching up. He was coaching a guy named Michael Johnson. They went up and played in Laramie, Laramie, Wyoming. And when the team went into the arena, it said, "Welcome to Laramie, altitude seventy eight hundred feet." And uh, um, Michael said to my dad, Coach, we can't press up here. It's too high up in the altitude. Oh, boy. My dad said, Michael, don't worry about it. We're playing indoors. It won't bother you. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. <laughs> uh, you know, wasn't wasn't your father one of those guys where, you know, I heard this a little bit about Lon Kruger, too, and there are certain coaches out there where, like, you didn't he didn't have to scream in practice. He didn't have to yell. You just knew when he had that look in his eye. Yep. The players were, I don't want to use the term afraid of it, but when they saw it, they knew that your father yeah. meant business. Is that accurate? Absolutely, and he was he was absolutely like that. He wasn't a big yeller, but when he did yell, you knew you knew you better straighten up. But he did. He gave you the look. He made those little liners on you. Uh, you know, like one one time he came into the locker room at halftime that we were being out rebounded by a team that had nobody taller than six five, and he came in and he yelled them, "Hurry up, guys! Hurry up! Please sit down, sit down. Get them some water. These hard blood." Red nose athletes, they got to be so tired after getting out rebounded by no team with a guy six foot five, and his sarcasm. And you know that it's funny, but you, again, you don't want to laugh. He, right. he just had a great sense of humor. One other thing about my father, which I try to put out in the book, which is unique to what I think any other coach. You know, uh, coaches always try to act like uh, they're politically correct. They don't favor anybody. They they do. They treat everybody the same. Well, 1981-82, we had two great players named Sidney Green and Larry Anderson. And we had some other really good players, and they were complaining that my father didn't uh, was favoring Sid and Larry. So. My dad called the team together after practice. He had to sit down. He said, you know, I understand some of you guys think I'm favoring Sid and Larry. Well, I want you to know that I am. They're carrying us. They're our lead scoring rebounder. 
if I'm on the, if we're on a desert island with one canteen of water, I'm going to give Sid and Larry everything they want to drink. If anything <laughs> left over, I might share with the rest of you. <laughs> oh man, I, I absolutely love that. That that is so awesome. You know, your father brought the Running Rebels to Las Vegas, right? It is the reason why they're calling the Running Rebels now. And I don't want to be negative. But, uh, you know, when Dave Rice was hired, you know, he said, let's bring the running Rebels back. Obviously, that didn't really work out. They had a lot of great players. Uh, but, you know, Dave Rice is a perfect example, right? He recruited great players, but he wasn't able to win games in March. Why is it that there are so many coaches out there that have the talent, but they don't win like the way your father was able to win here at UNLV? He, he, obviously, your dad had the talent, but he was able to get the guys to play together and win. What was the difference between your father and some of these other coaches? My father was able to take the inner city African-American athletes that were dominating college sports at the time. Most of them had problems off the court or in the classroom. And he was able to mold them together to play harder than any team in the country. And if you had anybody come watch you know, practice, they all would say the same thing. Red Harback from the Boston Celtics watched this practice one day. He said he's never seen a team play so hard. My dad's secret was he was able to get us to play so hard First, it, it happens in practice. My dad would always say, basketball is a game of habits. You can't do something on the, in a game that you're not practicing and doing. It's, it's repetition. So he got us to practice as hard as we possibly could. Hmm. We bought into it. And at the end, players were the ones pushing the other players. The coaches didn't have to do it. I mean, rebel, being a, a rebel meant that you worked harder than anybody out there. So he got them to play harder than anybody else. And the second thing he did was he got people to play their roles and accept it. The thing that Dave Rice didn't understand, and I listened to Larry, Larry uh, say to uh, you and me one time that, um, you know, my father was one of the first play- coaches to allow players to have the green light to shoot the ball because when they did, they would shoot better. And my dad was, but he was very clear that only two or three players on each team had that green light. Everybody mm. else had a role. I mean, That's my role was to pass to Larry, uh, Larry Anderson and Sidney Green. It was not to jack up shots. Right, so <laughs> right. We, we, all, we all accepted our role. Right. We were because we were part of the and that's family. so important that's so important i want to ask you about the players today and how your dad would coach them because as you know there's a lot of kids today these 17 18 19 year old kids that are very entitled uh some coaches would use the term soft and their parents might be soft you know everything has to be perfect for them how do you think your father would have adapted if he was coaching in this era today well i think his coaching style was more adapted uh, adaptable to these type of players than even the ones when he was coaching because he was in a scream or a yeller. And those coaches right now, they're not lasting very long. Players are rebellion, and unfortunately the schools and universities are going against the coaches when that happens. Uh, my dad was able to, uh, as I mentioned, motivate these players because of, of with the sarcasm, but because they had a great relationship and respect with him. My father, is, one of the things he always mentioned is you, can, <laughs> you, you can't have a great team if you don't have loyalty on that team, and loyalty is a two-way street. If the players feel that you're not loyal to them, they're not going to be loyal to you and support you. Mm -hmm. And my dad was loyal to a fault. He got himself in a lot of trouble uh, with the university and the MC2 because he stood by his players sometimes when they did things that weren't right, but he stood by them and showed that loyalty. But the players were always loyalty back. Let's talk a little bit about loyalty here. We only have a few minutes left here. We're speaking with Danny Tarkanian, of course, his father, the late great uh, Jerry Tarkanian, his new book out, Rebel with a Cause. He's going to be signing it at the UNLV basketball game tonight at the Thomas and Mack Center. Let's talk about loyalty. A lot of the fans, uh, a good amount of them, have left the Thomas and Mack Center, especially uh, ever since Lon Kruger left, Dave Rice came in here and then struggled, and then Marvin Menzies took over. That was a complete disaster. TJ's working with what he has right now. But what do you make of the fan support? Because it hasn't been great. The last couple games, the attendance has been so-so. But, Danny, if I told you, you know, what, 30 years later, that there'd be four or 5,000 people in the Thomas and Mack Center for a good majority of these games, what would you have said? Well, I would certainly have been surprised because, you know, these always had a solid foundation of a basketball program, even through some of the, the, the bad years they, they, they still did. But after a while, if you're not winning, fans just aren't going to come out and support you. And it's not just winning against bad teams. I mean, you could run some records up. But they want to see, you know, the fans want to see uh, them, the team play really good teams and, then, and they have success. Mm-hmm. If they don't have success, they're not going to come out. And it's more difficult now because they have alternatives. They can go to the Vegas, Knight, Vegas Knights game. They can go to the Raiders game a year from now. Uh, the Rebels have got to start winning. And I will tell you, I've watched TJ's teams play. And I never spoke with TJ. I, I, don't, I don't have a, a, a feeling from one way or the other. But they are out there trying to play defense. They're, they're playing hard, and that's something that has been missing over the past several years. 
And uh, if you can get some players who can uh, shoot a little bit better, I think they got a chance to be very good. I agree. I think so far he's done a decent job. Certainly an upgrade from uh, from our last uh, coaching coaching uh, stint with uh, Marvin Menzies. I want to ask you. I have to ask you since you're such a basketball guy, basketball family. With your experience, I have to ask you at least one question about Kobe Bryant. We all know the tragedy that took place several weeks ago. Uh, I've had the uh, very lucky enough to to meet Kobe on on many of occasions. I've been able to interview him because of USA Basketball here. Uh, Kobe has talked in the past about the Run and Rebels. He has made some comments in the past about how much he admired that national championship team. Uh, you know, just your thoughts on Kobe Bryant and what he meant for basketball and the things he did also off the court, if you can comment on that. His, his, his athletic ability, what he did on the court speaks for itself, but what he's done off the court, everybody respected him, and uh, he did so much to help the community. I mean, the way he died, he was taking his daughter and several other um, girls on our team to a youth basketball tournament that he coached, and uh, he did it you know, because of his love for that, love for the kids. Uh, it's a very sad thing that happened. It's something that should wake everybody up and have them appreciate the few moments they really do have on earth and, mm-hmm. and not take it for granted. Yeah, no question. I wanted to ask you a quick question about the Tarkanian Basketball Center right over there next to uh, Palace Station. I've uh, gone there many a times. I've refed some games there. I've watched some basketball there. We heard like several weeks ago there was some sort of fire that took place there, kind of a, a scary situation. Can you give us an update on uh, have they told you exactly how that happened and what what was the case, what happened there? We don't know what how it got started, but it was actually a fire outside the, the building underneath the stairway, and uh, nothing happened inside the building except there was a lot of smoke, so they had to clear the smoke out before we let people come back in and play, but nothing was damaged by the fire itself. Everything was good. Well, that's good news. I appreciate that. Well, Danny, I know you will be there tonight at the you, Thomas & Madison. Like, yep, go I'd ahead. I'd like to just say one thing. If anybody can't make the game but they would like to buy the book, they mm-hmm. can go to Amazon.com. They can either put in my name or they can go rebel with the cause and they'll be able to find it. And if you like the book, please write a review and post it on Amazon. It will help with the book sales. Yeah, and I look forward to reading it myself, Danny. Your stories with your father and UNLV basketball are endless, and I always enjoy talking to you about your dad and your family. Please the, please say hello. People, to, yep, go ahead. The people who grew up here in Las Vegas, well, they'll read the book, and it's going to – and I try to make it as vivid as possible. They're going to remember what those – wonderful days and really enjoy uh, it being brought back to life. That's awesome. Danny, I'm glad you wrote the book and I can't wait to read it myself. Please uh, send my regards to your wife, Amy. Thank you so much for joining us, Danny, and uh, look forward to seeing you tonight at the game, my friend. Thank you so much. Sounds good. We'll see you then. All right. You got it. There you go. Thanks a lot, Danny. Danny Tarkanian, uh, of course, the son of the late, great legend, Jerry Tarkanian. That will never be matched. Uh, Jerry is going to go down as one of the best college basketball coaches of all time. Uh, he was such a great manager. Uh, you know, he was such a great, in a way, like a Phil Jackson did in the NBA, dealing with egos. And he got those guys to play together, man. He got those guys to play defense and play together. And I, I rerun that game back and forth over and over again when they just kicked Duke's ass. I wish people would do that today. Just just destroy Duke because I hate Duke. <laughs> but, but, I mean, those were some great memories back then. And what Jerry Tarkanian did for UNLV and the way uh, the athletic department, some in the athletic department, treated Jerry, uh, Jerry the last few years of his career at UNLV was disgusting. And I hope that never happens again to any college basketball coach, especially a guy like the late, great Jerry Tarkanian. And again, uh, he's going to be signing his book, Danny Will Be Rebel With a Cause, at the UNLV basketball game tonight as they play Colorado State. Pretty good basketball team, by the way, Colorado State. So it should be a good game. When we come back, uh, J.D., I'm looking forward to talking to this guy. I know he's excited that the Raiders are coming to Las Vegas. Jay Schrader. Former Raider quarterback will be joining us next. Uh, talk a little Raiders football and talk about a big charity event that's coming up in Las Vegas soon that he's a part of. Jay Schrader coming up next. You're listening to the Vegas Take 101.5 FM, 720 AM, K Dawn.